Fantastic. Um, so we had a question from Eloise who was saying, do you think cryptography will have to go through a radical change if the Riemann hypothesis is solved? Since it's quite heavily reliant on the mystique of prime numbers. And I guess that also applies to the PNMP problem as well. Yes. Um, very, very good question. So so what I would say um, to that, so so if, so at the moment we, we basically use, uh, the current cryptography is, is to say, here is an extremely large number uh, which has been made by multiplying together two very very large prime numbers and um, if somebody hacks your information intercepts your message your encrypted message they are faced with this 200 long digit number and to be able to unencrypt it and hack into your data they have to find the two prime numbers that multiply together to give you this really really long number uh, and that is is basically is an np problem um, like you say, it links into NP. That is incredibly easy to check. If I give you the two numbers, you multiply them together, you get the answer. But if you need to find those two prime numbers, we currently have no efficient way of doing that. So, so that would be an NP problem. So either we somebody shows that P is equal to NP, that would mean all NP problems, or what are known as NP complete problems, all of those problems can now actually be solved through this very clever shortcut that that um, you know that, that somebody has magically found. It means that it exists. We just need to look hard enough for it. So that would be an issue because that would say it is possible to hack current encryption methods. Just to so keep looking for the way to do that to, to sort of to sort of say to the hackers. And and similarly for for Riemann, if we if a proof of Riemann or or even a counterexample gives us some new information about the primes maybe it's a pattern to the prime numbers on the number line. So at the moment, we don't know what that pattern is. Maybe somebody, when proving Riemann, stumbles across this magic formula that explains where prime numbers are. That, again, that's going to be super helpful when it comes to figuring out how to break down these really long numbers into primes. Because if you suddenly know which numbers are and aren't primes and where they're going to appear, you, you can kind of reformulate the whole problem in a much more easy-to-solve way um, and actually be able to solve it. So, so yes, I think either either improving our understanding of primes through Riemann or somebody showing P is equal to NP, either of those things would lead to a rethink about current prime number encryption. Fantastic. So we've had quite a few people who've been asking about um, using computers or potentially using quantum computers. So Yong Key said, why, why can computers not do the remaining Zeta question? And Zach Lee asked, uh, do you think quantum computing can play a big part in solving sorts of problems? I think uh, Sanya Kubnani also said a similar thing as well. Um, so, so for the, for the um, talking about the Zeta, the Zeta function, so, so finding the zeros, um, so computers are used, absolutely used in that process. So, so when I said we, we know the smallest, the first 10 billion zeros, I think it is, of the zeta function, we know what they are. And the vast majority, of course, were found using computers. Like, there's no way somebody actually sat down and checked the first 10 billion numbers. So, so we've, we've used computers to find those zeros. And so far, none of them, or sorry, so far, all of them, have real part equal to one half. But again, that just, unfortunately, that isn't enough for a mathematician. You need that, you, you can do it forever. Like again, if you're a physicist, like, like you've done 10 billion experiments, you've got the same answer. Like why would you keep doing the same experiment? But, but to a mathematician, there are, and there are examples of this littered throughout history of, of things that look like they could be true. You test them on lots and lots of cases, they look like they're true theorems. But then somebody finds a counterexample out in the tens of billions of trillions, and that number just happens to be a counterexample. So, so I guess like mathematicians have been burned enough in the past <laughs> through these kinds of problems that even though we know it's almost certainly true, like until we've got that absolute proof that you cannot argue with, until we have that, uh, we're never we're not going to take it for granted. So, so the computers can be used, but they're not going to give you that proof. That's going to require some kind of insight. So computers are great for like number crunching, but to come up with the actual method, you have to program it as, as a human. Unless, of course, machine learning becomes incredible and almost like overtakes the computational and creative power of humans. But hopefully that won't happen because that would be terrifying. 
And and just to add, do you think quantum computing would be a problem? I've, I've heard quantum computing might potentially be another way that we could shortcut, for example, the, the prime factorial internet cryptography yes. problem. So, so again, um, the so so if you if you take the traveling salesman the problem that we, that we looked at and and the idea that to check 100 cities longer than the age of the universe so that's on current computers but i don't think we yet appreciate or realize the potential well maybe we do realize the potential of quantum computers but the the computational power could be so great that it doesn't matter that if it currently takes the length of the universe to solve on our computers Maybe on a quantum computer, it can do it in a week. Like, I think, you know, th that is certainly within the realms of possibility. So, so you can't rule it out. So you can't say, um, you know, that, that quantum computers won't uh, be able to solve these problems quickly. I, I think it's likely they will, but it's whether or not they can solve them sufficiently quicker that, that it brings it down to that manageable uh, level. So, so as I sort of hinted at, it's, it's a bit more technical, but you have polynomial time and exponential time so at the moment if something is easy to solve you solve it in polynomial time whereas if it's hard to solve it takes exponential or factorial time so the traveling salesman is very obviously a factorial time problem which makes it hard hmm. um so uh, a few slightly uh, obscure questions here so no worries, I like a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a few people asked some questions that I didn't understand, so you can maybe give quick answers to those. Yeah. So Deirdre Haydecker says, please can you confirm that zeta of minus one does not diverge? <laughs> okay, so I showed zeta of minus one was minus one over 12. Uh, so I'm going to say two things. First of all, watch the number file video about this, because it's like, that'll explain it more than I, better than I ever can. Uh, and second of all, um, the proof of that uses something called analytic continuation, which is a very valid mathematical technique. Um, and using the tools of analytic continuation, it is correct to say zeta of minus one equals minus one twelfth. However, if you take it out of that context, then it doesn't make any sense. So uh, irregular equilateral hexagon uh, and Rodney Buckland both asked about techniques that I've never heard of. Okay. So, so irregular equilateral hexagon said, would this be a good example of a situation where alpha beta pruning would be appropriate? Whereas Rodney Buckland said, how about using simulated annealing? I've no idea what either of those things are. I, I'm afraid they've, they've both gone over my head as well. <laughs> I, I would guess they sound like uh, potential computer science type uh, techniques and theories. Um, so, so P versus MP is a very interesting one because because it really does cross, it's at that interface between maths mm. and computer science. Um, so, so I am only know about the mathematical side of things. I will not pretend to have any knowledge. I'm only pretending to have a little bit of knowledge of the maths, but I really have no knowledge of the, of the computational uh, sort of uh, aspects of the problem. Fair enough. Um, so Eric, uh, Eric asks, asks, can you solve the Poincaré problem in fractal dimensions? So, you know, n is 1.5 or something. Oh, that, that's a nice question. Um, I honestly don't know. That's a very, very interesting question. So, so I perhaps should have said the, the, the Poincaré statement was that this should be true uh, in n dimensions where n is an integer, positive integer. Uh, but no, it's a very good point. So, so in case people um, have never heard of fractal dimensions, these are very fun. Um, they're called, uh, are they called the Hopf dimension? I think they're called the Hopf dimension or something like that uh, for a particular um, function. And what it means is when you have a fractal, which is this you can think of it as a very wiggly line, very, very, very spiky wiggly line. Um, then you can interpret a fractal as having a, a non-whole number uh, dimension. So my favorite example of this is actually uh, the coastline of the UK. So the coastline of the UK is very jagged uh, and it's actually fractal in its nature. And that has a, a Hopf dimension of 1.26. So even though it's a straight line, so it should have dimension one, because it's a line, because it's so jagged and so wiggly, you can uh, actually approximate its dimension as 1.26. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a whole load of fun you can have with, with um, non-integer dimensions. So I don't, I, as far as I'm aware, that hasn't been looked at for, for Poincaré. Yeah, I, I was always taught, think about just getting a very loose rope around the, uh, uh, around the coast of the UK, and that will be one length. And then the closer yeah. and closer and closer you fit that rope to the coastline, the more little in and out bits you get into, and therefore the longer and longer and longer and longer that total length yeah. gets. 
or, or even or even using if you do a one meter ruler you get answer one you go back with a 30 centimeter ruler you get a bigger answer the coastline hasn't changed length you go back with a one centimeter ruler you know it seems bigger again and you kind of repeat forever yeah so just got, I know we've run over slightly, um, so thanks to everyone for sticking with us, but there's just a couple more questions I'd like to uh, run yeah. past you before we finish. Uh, so one was, uh, Roger Wright asks, are there any other problems that you think are as difficult or indeed as important? Ooh. So, so um, okay, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so there's, there's certainly lots of really, really famous unsolved maths problems still out there. So the um, Goldback conjecture is a great one. Uh, this talks about uh, whether you can, I think it's whether you can add every number is the sum of two primes. I think it's something like that. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> this is a, I'm not a number theorist, but, but it's very, very straightforward to, to say out loud that the Goldback conjecture is a classic, looks really easy when you say it and you can explain to, to almost anybody, but has been around for, I think, over 100 years. No one can solve it at the moment. Uh, we can't get a proof of that. So that's another one that's obviously very tricky. Um, there's something else called the Collatz conjecture, uh, which again, similar kind of thing that's been around a long time um, that, that, that we haven't really been able to solve yet. Um, and, and another one that is very interesting with regards to millennium problems would be uh, Fermat's last theorem. So this, of course, uh, was possibly is the most famous maths problem. Uh, it was solved in the mid 90s by Andrew Wiles. Uh, the where I work, the Mass Institute in Oxford, where I work, is the Andrew Wiles, Sir Andrew Wiles building. Um, it's named after him, which is very cool, and he still works there. Very, very occasionally see him around. Um, but so he solved Fermat's last theorem in the mid '90s, and it's that was after 354 years or something that had been around without a proof. Uh, so that would almost certainly have been a millennium problem if it hadn't been solved five years previous. Um, so, so those, it's that kind of idea of something that if you can find almost any problem that's been around for a hundred years plus, um, then, then I think it, it's, that to me probably signifies how difficult that problem is and would be very similar to, you know, in difficulty perhaps to, to all of these kinds of problems. So which do you think will be solved next? Next. If you had ah. to put money on it. Okay. Uh, right. There's a few ways of looking at this one. Um, so I know the most about Navier Stokes, and I know that in the last 20 years since the Millennium Problem, we've made almost immeasurable progress. So, so we actually now can show that the Navier Stokes equations are well posed in, um, I think it's either in two dimensions, no, in two dimensions for all time or in three dimensions for finite time. So we need, well, we need three dimensions for all time. So like we're really close to Navier Stokes, uh, but obviously that, that last step's often the hardest. Uh, so, so, so that one I think has some, uh, again, probably because I'm most aware of it, that one certainly I think potentially could be soon. Uh, Riemann, just because uh, it's the most attempted. As I said, I think there's about 10 Riemann hypothesis proofs added to the archive uh, every day. I get sent about one a week. Um, so so like I think, in general, there's so many people trying the Riemann hypothesis that you kind of think the laws of large numbers say eventually somebody, even if you're throwing blindly, eventually you're going to hit the bullseye. Uh, so, so, so if I had to bet, maybe I would say Riemann. Um, but yeah, Riemann or Navier Stokes. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, uh, we've been getting a lot of you've get, been getting a lot of love in the chat, to be honest, Tom. And lots of people are asking, um, you know, when are you going to do the other problems, or where can they find out more? I mean, do you have more on your website? Uh, I do. So, so I've I've written a series of articles on my website. Um, so literally, it's right there, isn't it? TomRocksFast.com. <laughs> if you search Millennium Problems uh, or click Read uh, on the on the menu, then you'll get some articles, and there is a section on the Millennium Problems. Uh, they're not super detailed, but there's a bit more there with some links to other stuff. Um, I don't, I talked, to, oh, and I did, um, I forgot about this. I did a, a live stream. I did a 90 minute live stream on my YouTube channel, uh, which is called the 10K subscriber celebration live stream, as, as apparently us YouTubers do. Someone told me I had to do this, so I did it. Um, and I actually spend 90 minutes uh, going through all of the problems. But there I'm using just a blackboard and some chalk. So it's a bit more technical, 
but but you can go and watch a 90 minute video of me saying very similar things to what I've said here, but perhaps at the next level above this. Um, so so less visually appealing, but <laughs> I do talk a little bit more about them, and I do cover the other the other three. I do talk Gang Mills, Hodge, uh, and Bert Swinnerton and Dyer. So, so that'll be my recommendation. My YouTube channel and the 10K subscriber uh, celebration live stream.